Hello, good morning, welcome back to the Fishlock Air out on the boat. We have a lovely, damp, misty, miserly Cornish morning for you this morning. We've got a little tiny bit of clear sky over that way where the sun's just coming up, but on the other side of us, this is what we've had pretty much for the last 48 hours. Just that minging rain that clings to you and gets you soaked. A flat, calm day, we're gonna have a bit of westerly and a bit of northerly later on, and tiny tides. So hopefully I'm going to get a chance to give the boat a run, maybe anchor up, see what we can find. Just going to be one of those days today, we were just going to see what we can find. Let's go. Let's try and find some bait. Some lovely mackerel there. Right tight on the bottom there. A couple more and it'll do us. Perfect. I wish that happened all the time. <laughs> Hopefully this will put to bed a myth. Now I've been asked quite a few times before by people saying this. If you touch a mackerel and you release it, it will die. That's absolute nonsense. Obviously the more you handle it, if you're going to release it, you're not going to do it any favours. But this one here, look at that wound on its side there. That has been bitten by a taupe. A taupe or some type of, like, well, very sharp toothed creature. And that is swimming around perfectly fine. So after being nearly bitten in half by a shark, this fish is still swimming around all right. And yet you think that it's gonna die if I touch it. Sorry, but it's just not true. Another one of those Malicious rumours spread by the anti-fishing crowd. Well, I've managed to cover the boat in scales. <laughs> Let's go and see if we can't find some fish. I've got to a little patch of reef that I fished last year. And all I'm going to do is I'm just running a quick drift over the top of it. Just to see which direction the boat's going to go. Because at the moment we've got very light wind and tide together. So I'm hoping that if I can get the anchor down, it will sit me in a perfect direction. Ideal situations when you're anchoring up are either wind and tide together or no wind at all. So that you sit in one straight direction. If you've got your wind across tide, the boat can swing around quite a bit. So I'll just, I'll run this on for another five minutes. Very small tide today, so I aren't expecting to catch very much on the lows. You generally need bigger tides for that. Give it five minutes now, and I'll talk you through the anchor setup. I'll get the anchor put down. Anchoring up on rough ground, what I'll use is I'll use a grapple anchor like this, and I have it rigged with a weak link there, so that if this ever comes snagged up, when I pull to, when I pull real hard, I'll snap this mono, and it pulls out the anchor backwards. I have. Uh, 15 feet of chain and on my rope I run an Alderney ring and a boy now the boy apart from just being an anchor boy also helps you when you're hauling the anchor I'll talk to you about that later but I'm going to be anchoring up in around about 40 meters of water so I'm going to be letting out about 80 to 100 meters of rope uh, tides are only real slack there's nothing really going on today I'll maybe get away with a little bit less but usually you run at about two to two and a half times the depth of rope. Let's swing the boat round, get the anchor down. I 
I have my anchor rope marked in depth. You see a black line leave there. If it was all the same colour, you would never know how much rope you put out. That is 100. Next will be 150, then 200, then, and so on. There's no worse than chucking a rope over the side and you get after and you're like, oh no, how much is that? Right, yeah, the anchor's on the seabed. I'll keep running the rope out, I'll swing around, and hopefully we'll get laid back. That looks safe. Now for boats that have got a walk around, as in you can walk around the outside, this is easier, because all you do is you just run it out over the side, and then walk the boat, walk the rope around the boat. What I'll do here, is I've got out the length that I want, I'll then tie it to the frame, go out through the window, reach back, and then pass it through the cleat. It saves you messing about out with the hatch at the front. There we are, the boat's laid back now quite comfortably. What I'm going to be fishing, I'm going to be fishing two types of rigs, a heavy one and a light one. And the, night, the light one's going to be some variation of like a two hook rig, like a two hook flapper. Actually, I'm going to shorten that hook length. I'm going to fish my light rods for things like bream. I'm going to fish a couple of heavy rods for things like conger. I like to try and get some big baits down there because big baits, big scent. Now you will catch fish on them little baits straight away, probably like cuckoo wrasse, pouting, whiting, that type of thing. But the more scent you can get down there, like I've literally just turned up here. So I want to get as much scent going as possible to draw in as many fish as possible. It's a lovely day, isn't it? Black calm. It's an eerie type of day. I mean, it's, it's very, very foggy offshore. It'll be a very eerie day offshore. There you go. Look. Just little hooks and bits of squid. All I'll do is I'll just... We are going to get a bycatch of pouting and cuckoo rast today. It's inevitable. But pouting is also a great bait for conger. Now I did schoolboy error today. I did forget my filleting knife. I've left my filleting knife in the garage. Luckily enough, I carry this on me all the times. So let's get my leatherman nice and messy. <laughs> All I've done there is I've just got some little packets of calamari and I've just sliced them up into small pieces. Oh, bite straight away. That was a very rassy bite. Got it. Oh, it's digging a bit, this one. This feels pretty good, this actually. Oh, you beauty. Yes. Don't come off, don't come off. Wow. Oh my goodness, straight away target species. And it's a beauty as well. That is a fantastic black bream. Look at the size of that. And a milk cooker ras. <laughs> I did say we'd get some cooker ras, didn't we? But I tell you what, that bream is an absolute stonker. What a fantastic specimen. Perfect example of the species. Calm down, lad. They are just covered in spines. Get this hook out. Just a little hook. In fact, we can go in that live bait tank. Amazing. <laughs> First drop on the mark. Exactly what I was after. And it's a big one as well. That one's going to go home for food. 
I'm going to take that one to Jim's. We also have a lovely looking male cuckoo wrasse. Oh, I made up with that frame. <laughs> oh, yes. Tell you what, it's that type of excitement. I, I felt when I got the button, I struck into it, I was like, that's a good fish, that. And I don't know if you noticed, but the fight was like a really jagged fight. It was like a dun -dun -dun -dun. it was constantly digging to get away. I thought to myself, I thought, that's going to be a bream, that. I didn't want to say out because I thought I'll jinx myself, but I did kind of think in my mind, I thought, that's a good fish, that. That's excellent, that. that's that's over two pound. I'd um, I have my own, I have my own kind of limits in my mind as to how big, or how small, how big or how small fish need to be for me to keep them. Like a slot size, like a minimum and a maximum. And bream, I don't like taking bream if they're under two pound and over four pound. So that is perfect. Oh, I haven't even got the big baits out yet. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell I'm, I'm really happy with that. Tell you what, we'll try that again. That was literally just just a chalk, chalk flapper rig with a little bit of squid. And I think I've got a one and a half ounce lead on there. Bit more water. Another bite straight away. Oh, it's not putting up as much of a fight as the last one. Feels a little bit more rassy. And that's why. Another gorgeous looking male cuckoo wrasse. Back you go, lad. Someone's been ragging at that bit as well. Look, just, just little tiny hooks and little scraps of squid. I will get them big baits down there. I'll knock this out. I'll start filleting them fish off. Start filleting them mackerel off. The other rigs that I'm going to be using are just my conga rigs. I have been working in conjunction with Cox and Roll to produce these conga rigs. I'll put a link in the description of here. Yeah, perfect for ling and conga. Right. I think it's had me bait away here. Yep. Snaffled on me bait. Yeah, these conga rigs. All I'm going to do is I'm going to bait them with a mackerel flapper. There we are. Now I've taken off the fillets from two sides. I've made these baits quite small because I'm expecting that we're going to get quite a few small congas to start with. So out of one fish, I have made three baits. A little pod of porpoise just went past. These are best fished, very simply, in a running ledger. So all I'll have is I'll just have a swivel, a slider, and clip on my hook length there. That's it. Perfect for ling, conger, and you also occasionally catch a decent bull hustle like that. Oh, there we are. Nice little bite. Feels rassy that one. Let it develop, see if a bream will come along. And a ballon ras.
could tell that was a, <laughs> could tell that was a ballon and not a cuckoo. Really violent bite. Got something playing around with that conga bait as well. I'm trying to get another conga bait down there sharpish. But I've got something playing with that. Especially for congas like this, generally the small ones come out first. You get a run of straps, you'll get a run of fish that are like what? Two to eight pounds before the bigger ones come out to play. When I mean, you might knock a big one straight on the head, but usually it's the smaller ones first. <laughs> There's solid weight, so possibly spider crab. Oh, what did I say? Spider crab. Just feel like a consistent heavy weight. One of these little fellas. That's a bite. That feels creamy. That feels very breamy. Be gentle with this one. Yep. That is another fantastic black bream. Calm down, lad, calm down. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They are just absolutely covered in spines. But isn't that an amazing looking fish? Another absolute stunner. Hmm, the boat has healed around a little bit. The boat has swung around a little tiny bit. Tide's probably changed. Let's get some more of that squid down there. That's nearly them bream. Oh no. Whatever it was, I think I had two of them. And now I've only got one. Easy lad, easy. Yeah, I had two on to start with and one's popped off. But They are just covered in spines. Here you go. There's another one. Slightly smaller. I'll let this one go. Yeah. Tell by straight off I had two on. One come off halfway up. Just quickly tied up another bream rig, which is just a uh, a pair of twisted bone blood loops. I'm just going to snip them off and tie a couple of size four chinos on them. Just very simple. Fishing about in this rough ground, you are going to lose gear. It's it's inevitable. It's just part of fishing in rough ground. So keeping the tackle as simple as possible, in my mind, not only does that minimise snags because there's less tackle to snag up in the rocks, but also if you ever do lose any, you don't lose that much because it's very simple. Yeah, there's a fish. Well, that was a really weird one. It just swam straight up in the water. Got another one on that side. Just a little strap. Now, just a little strap conga reel. I've also got one on the other rod. You know what I said about the smaller ones coming on the feed first? But yeah, that really didn't behave like one. Yep, 
Yeah, every time I caught up to it, I was winding like that. Every time I caught up to it, it just kept swimming up and up and up. It was a really one, a really weird one, just like a spur dog. Got it. The smallest one of the day, and he put up a cracking fight. Come on, lad. This is another thing that happens with the smaller eels. Just a menace. Well, I guess I'll untangle that then. Oh, I'll bring that again. I've cracked it today. Beautiful, aren't they? Oh. Right, get all this drama sorted out. <laughs> Lovely to see, aren't they? Pair of harbour paupers. <laughs> I think they're fantastic. I don't know if you can see their teeth. A little tiny teeth in there. Covered in spines, though. We're after one a little bit bigger. I honestly, I think it's probably them that's attacking me, me conga baits as well. Don't very often catch black bream, so it is really nice when you find some. The patch where I'm at. Patch where I'm at is there's a little patch of rock right in the middle of a great load of sand. So where I'm anchored at the minute, I'm fishing onto that little patch of sand, that little patch of rock. I mean, it's only about 40 foot across. So as soon as the tide turns, I'm going to be pushed off it. Found an eel that's found a hole. Yeah, there's a little bite on that, and it's a little eel and it's backed into a hole. Best thing you can do there is if you leave a bit of slack, the fish might come back out of the hole. As soon as it does, you need to get on top of it. Another one. Now, just two minutes since. Just been, just had a really good savage bite on this, on this little bream rod, and all of a sudden, it just went light. When I come up, I'd been bit off, been bit off on the floor row, on my leader. So I'm possibly assuming has happened. They are lovely, aren't they? What I'm assuming has maybe happened is there is either a taupe or a little paw beagle shark down there. And after I've hooked a bream and been bringing it up, it's come straight in and just bitten the trace off. So it's come in and taken the fish that I've hooked, and bitten the trace off. So it was, look, just a squid. Yeah, so we've got something big and toothy down there. So I'm down to using this rig, the homemade one. Get another little one of these. Yeah, the tide's moved, the tide's changed, and we've swung off that little patch of rock that we were fishing onto. So the bites are, are starting to slow down a lot. 
I must have had 20 of them bream. I think it's fantastic. Lost one more, what I think was a conga. Just a little one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the anchor up and I'm going to go and try somewhere else. Fish these baits out for another five minutes while I square everything away. We'll get the anchor pulled and we'll try somewhere else. But look at it now. What a stunning day we've got now. I wouldn't have thought this this morning when I was heading out. It was horrible. Just that, that really damp, depressing weather. <laughs> We have had a little pair of porpoise all round us all day. Just still up here now. See if we can't find a little bit of a deeper rock mark and pull out some conga. I don't know if you can see, but the anchor's now, the, the boy's burying under the water, which means the anchor has reached the boy. One thing about running an anchor over the side is make sure you keep your feet flat on the deck. That way, if your, if your feet never leave the deck, you won't get any rope wrapped around them. Get rope wrapped around one of your feet when you go up, when anchor goes over. I've seen people get pulled over the side. It's worse when you're shooting pots. Shooting pots away. The bite gets around your foot and that drags you straight off the side. Two most dangerous times when anchoring is when hauling or shooting. Fishing in a much deeper mark now. And I've just dropped my little breamy rigs down. And immediately latched into a fat pouting. Until we're deeper now. Now the tide, at the moment, we are doing absolutely nothing. We're going nowhere. It's slack water. So the boat is rolling around. Just kind of any which way within about 20 minutes the tide will start running again and the wind is forecast to pick up so we'll have wind and tide together again oh there's a fish from the conga rig there's a proper bite that one Come off. No, no, it might still be there. It'd just be a small one. Oh, that's why. It's not a small eel. But it is a very big pouting. <laughs> he's a monster. And he's spitting up. Would you believe it? I'm going to show you. Spitting up ragworms. Now that is a very big pouting. Greedy fella. That there took an entire mackerel flapper. There's some fishing gear just showing up. Slack water, what happens sometimes? This fishing gear that's trapped on the bottom, when there's a tide running, it pushes it under the surface. There's one just popped up like 15 feet away from the boat. We'll have to move. I'm not quite sure what this is, it's just a solid weight. But I've got a bite on all three rods. Oh, it's knocked back a little bit then. Oh! <laughs> I 
Would you believe it? That's a ling. <laughs> a micro ling. Yeah. That's a ling of about a pound. Usually when I'm targeting ling, I'm going for ones that are like 20 pound plus. Oh. Caught on a 1-0 hook. You can tell it's a member of the cod family by this barbel here. Oh, there's a good bite on the big rod. As with many other fish, when they're juvenile, they get... I'm going to have to do something about that. Talk to you about that ling in a second. Well, that was a proper bite on here then. Chuck that down out of way. Yeah, when someone bends over the tip of this rod, you know it's a decent fish. Well, I say decent. Be a little baby conger. <laughs> As if that was a little tiny ling. Oh. Just the dogfish making a nuisance of himself. Well, that's the doggy out of the way anyway. We haven't had one yet this session. So with any luck, that'll be the only one. Anyway, like I was saying, with this ling, as with quite a lot of species of fish, the younger ones have got a very different coloration, a very different coloration to the adults. Now ling, when they're small, they have a lovely mottly color up and down their sides, which is obviously better camouflage for them when they're only this size. Good lad. There is some pecking at that one, but I'm going to get another big bait out and try and get some scent going. I don't know if you can see that piece of fishing gear in the distance now. Yeah, when it popped up, when the tide dropped off, it popped up right next to the boat, but as the tide's turned again, it's run right over there. So it does mean that there probably will be crab pots down on the seabed somewhere near where I am. Hopefully we don't snag into any. Yeah, hopefully we can manage to avoid them. Bringing something on this rod, and that one over there is going absolutely, <laughs> absolutely mental. Ooh, that was a cracking bite. Give that a little tiny bit of line. That was a really good bite, that. And on this one, we have another fat pouty. Yeah. Conger and Ling do give good bites. This one is giving a good bite. Yep. It feels like a link. But you can never be 100%. Well, there it is there. Not far away now. Like I say, it feels like a ling, but it could be a conger. By shaking its head like that, you could see when it was going like ding ding. Let me, yeah, it is, it's a ling. Clip the trace. Okay. 
see that's why I end all of my traces in a clip and a swivel so when it comes to something like this I can just unclip it put the rod aside and deal with the fish but yeah that is a lovely rough groundling taken on my fish locker conger rig like I said perfect for ling and conger the reason why you need tough line is I don't know if you can see them teeth in there but they are wicked Get a T-bar on this guy. Yeah. T-bar the hook out. Right. Unfortunately, that hook did did nick into its gill. So this is this fish is bleeding out. So I'm going to dispatch it now. People always comment to me and saying, "Oh, you shouldn't be putting your fingers in its gills if you're going to release it." I will show you with this fish now look by sliding your hand up the inside of the gill cover your fingers do not come in contact with the gills these gills are very delicate if you slide your hand right up the inside of there so it's just running up the inside of there it doesn't come in contact with the gill, the gill membranes nice. I'll get this guy dispatched luckily for me Ling is a fantastic eating fish <laughs> it's having to pick which rod to pick up. I've just had two cracking bites on each rod. Got two big baits down now. I've stopped stopped fishing with the smaller baits because I've caught enough pouting for the pot. Caught enough pouting for bait and for the pots. Oh. I don't know what this is. This is it is something small. It is it's got to be spur dogs or something like that. They're absolutely ravaging the bait and then they're just dropping it like the bites are really really aggressive and they're just not staying on the hook one of the bites nearly took that other rod over the side so it's not little fish I think what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to scale, scale a rig down, put a smaller hook on it. Scale right down to like a four row or something. Yeah, I'll be back in a minute. Oh, that's a bigger fish. only just lightly hooked the hook's just in a little tiny bit of his skin he's probably gonna pop off now see if I can't chin gaff him that was how lightly he was hooked look the hook's just come straight out A slightly better eel for you there. All I did with the gaff there is because it was just nicked in a tiniest bit of his skin. If I'd have given him any slack at all there, it would have just popped straight off the hook. So all I did was just nick the hook through his, through his jaw. And all it is, it's just like, just like anything, any type of Nick that you go in your mouth, it heals incredibly fast. So there, we just lifted him out. Off his jaw. But yeah, that was a slightly better fish. I have rigged a smaller bait on a smaller hook on the lighter rod. And I am going to suspend it a couple of feet off the bottom to hopefully find whatever it was. Because it was honestly just like a pack of something and moped in. I'm expecting spur dogs. 
It's like a ragging hard bit, a ragging hard bite like that. And then nothing, as if like a pack had just moved through. The reason why I'm suspending this a couple of feet off the bottom is because I don't want a conger on it. Playing congers on really, really light gear. I mean, you can you can manage it from a clean beach as long as you get a good hook hold. But if you try to fish into rough ground or to wrecks with really light gear, you just end up losing loads of fish and you end up leaving fish with tackle in their mouths. It's to be avoided at all costs. <laughs> Getting the fish out on the feed is key to doing this. Now there's, there's fish down there now that are coming on the scent and they must be competing because I'm getting bites on every rod at all times. So they're obviously down there arguing with each other trying to fight over the bait. Now it's just about which one's going to commit to it first. Oh we might have a customer. Yes. Oh no, he dropped it. <laughs> that was that was a good heavy fish, but he obviously just had all of the bait in his mouth. Just saw like a little creeping by like that and I thought I know that. But I left that another 10 seconds and I've had it in his mouth. Got a fresh bait on and get back down. Yep. God, it's another one. It's got to be right on them today. The must, the the, 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 the seabed down there must just be like Swiss cheese. Because this fish had only just come out for a bite. There we go, it's out. It's out with a snag, but I've lost the fish. They're living in all like the cracks and the crannies and they're obviously just, just poking their head out, grabbing a bait and then backing back in it. Dogfish! <laughs> I really don't want to have to end on a dogfish. I'm going to fish these last couple of baits out, then we'll get the anchor up. Because I've got to go and pick James up from school in a bit. And another one. Please. <laughs> Next two minutes, not a dogfish. Well, it does look like we're going to end on a dogfish, a double dogfish. What a fantastic session so far. Considering it was just going to be a scratching around day, I've had the best bream fishing that I've ever had. Best black bream fishing, anyway. Um, I did move around and I did find some decent ground where I used my fish locker conga rigs and I had some nice conga and a nice eating link. Now I am. I'm hoping, I've got one bait still out now and I'm hoping I'm not going to end up the dogging. But, if I do, so be it. I'm just going to pull the anchor up and get home because I need to go and pick James up from school. I hope you've enjoyed joining me. All the very best. See you later. Oh, oh, please. Oh, we have something. <laughs> it's not very big, whatever it is. Ah, <laughs> I don't know if it's better to finish on a dogfish or a poor cod. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed joining us. All the very best. See you later.